So let's, uh, let's pray for this message. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We glorify you in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for your word. We think that it's alive, that it's active, that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. God, we pray today that you'd use this word to change us, challenge us, and convict us. Father, as you brought us into this place, Lord, we pray that we would not leave here the same way that we came in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew 17, we're being verses 24 through 27. When they had come to Capernaum, those who had received the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, yes. When he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Peter said, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook and take the fish that comes up first. When you have opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. It's a fun story, man. There's a lot going on in here. Let me, let me explain to you the story, and then we're going to get into a teaching component, and then we're going to make it hurt. It's going to be good. <laughs> so when, when they had come to Capernaum, those who had received the temple tax came to Peter and says, teach not pay the temple tax. There's a tax that needed to be paid to the temple, and so they, they're trying to, you know, stumble up Jesus. So they say, hey, is your guy going to pay the tax? Peter's like, yeah, I'm taking the tax, because Jesus is Jesus. He's somewhere else. He knows Peter's going to come and talk to him about this. So he says, as Peter comes in, he says, uh, you know, if a guy was a king and he was going to take taxes, who would he take it from? Peter's like, he, he wouldn't take it from his sons. He'd take it from his subjects. And so Jesus goes, that's my point. I am king. I'm not going to pay no tax, but we don't want to lead people into sin. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to go down, go fishing, catch one fish. There's going to be money in the mouth. We're going to pay for this temple tax with you and for me. Um, I, I, I told the first service and I'll tell you the same thing. I, the title of this sermon is coin in a fish mouth. And the reason why is because in this story, there's a coin and there's a fish and it's in his mouth. What we're talking about today is going to be like, we're just going to be all over the place. Why? Because that's just how it ended up. I was really trying to have a central theme to it all, and I couldn't really find one. The Lord will reveal one to you because you're going to walk out of here um, wondering what happened. Uh, But it, it will be good for you. Open up your heart to what God is speaking to you today, and we'll just see where he takes it. Amen. I want to talk to you first about the temple tax, because I think it's important for you to understand this part of the temple tax. Uh, the temple tax uh, was half a shekel. Uh, we know that from Exodus chapter 30, verse 13 through 16. Everybody 20 and under, uh, above had to pay this tax. Now, the way the, pe- the, the tax worked is that the rich didn't pay more and the poor didn't pay less. Everybody paid the same amount. It was a flat tax. Say amen if you wish they had the flat tax today. Uh, This was to make atonement for themselves. This was so that they could pay the penalty for their sin. And then they would take the money and they would use it for the service of the tabernacle. So in those three uses that they would use for this money. So uh, the people would come, they'd take the money, they would pay the tax, it would go into the coffers. And the three main uses they used it for is, first off, was paying the Levites. The Levites were the priests. It says in Numbers 18, 21, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work in which they performed, the work of the tabernacle of the meeting. So they would take the money, they would give it to the temple, and then they would use that money to pay the priests for the work that they did for the tabernacle of meeting. Uh, This is just the system that God set up back then so that the priests could get paid. It sounds somewhat familiar, right? They didn't have to be concerned with running land or having business or anything else. They were only concerned with the things of God. They were only concerned with the temple. And, um, and God even went so far as that when Israel went in and inherited the promised land, the, the Levites didn't inherit land. They inherited the tithe. That was the means by which God had to say, I want to have my priests only be concerned with my business. So you guys are going to take the temple tax to pay them. Se- uh, sound familiar? Uh, the second part is repairing the house of God. When I said sound familiar, it means like you guys understand because that's how I get paid, right? Yeah. It's a similarity. Okay. Repairing, and it does. It affords me to just be concerned with the things of God so that I can... Yeah. Spend 20 hours this week figuring out with fish in a mouth. Because if not, I'd be like, so anyway, just figure it out. God be with you. Anyway, 
preparing the house of God. That's the second thing they would use the temple tax for. Second Chronicles 24, 5. Then he gathered the priests and the Levites and said to them, go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year and see that you do it quickly. Um, even thousands of years ago, the people of God would meet in buildings, four walls and a roof. When you put humans inside of buildings, you guys bust stuff up. You break the walls, you break what people sit on because they just, you know, that's just how humans work. And so the house of God still needed repair because of weather or anything else. Sound familiar? Kind of the same thing we do here. Things happen, you know, the chairs break and the parking lot needs to be resurfaced. You need air conditioning and light bulbs go out. So the money, the temple tax, goes to be able to pay for the repairs of the house, the place where people go to meet and worship God. Thirdly, doing the work of the ministry, Nehemiah 10, 32 through 33. Also, we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of the Lord, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering to the Sabbath, the new moons, the set feasts, for the holy things, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. So they would take the temple tax and then that money would be used to be able to do the work of the ministry because Back then, they had lavers and bowls and gold and animals to sacrifice. That stuff just doesn't come out of thin air. They had to take that money and go buy animals to sacrifice. They had to buy the gold to be able to make things for, uh, you know, the ornaments that they had. It's no different than what we do today, right? People pay tithe, and we take that money so that we can have musical instruments. We can have sound systems. We can have these things. And people say, why do we need those things to worship God? All throughout history, man, the people of God have bought things things so that they can more adequately worship God. And everywhere you go all over the planet, I don't care how poor of a country that you go to, you talk to any pastor, he wants, uh, their church wants a place to meet, they want a sound system, they want stuff to be able to just worship God. Just so, in the best way possible, we can vertically worship God, and we can hear from His Word, so we can fellowship, so we can do all these other things. It's not any different than what they did thousands of years ago. That's the temple tax. So what was Jesus teaching in this interaction? Well, what Jesus was teaching to, to Peter was this idea. Now, remember, you, now don't worry about it until we get to the end of this portion because it's kind of like all over the place. We get to the point. Is that P- Peter was challenged. Why, how come your guy doesn't play the temple tax? Remember, Matthew's written to a Jewish audience. Because it's written to a Jewish audience, Matthew is uh, conveying what Jesus was conveying to the people at the time, which was to understand that Jesus is Messiah. He's Lord and that he's king. At this point, Jesus had not yet been glorified. At this point, Jesus had not shown himself, you know, because he hasn't come back from the dead yet, to show that he's, you know, God in the flesh. And so at this point in the story, and they come to Peter and say, does your man pay the temple tax? And he's like, yeah, he pays the temple tax. But then Peter goes to go talk to Jesus. Jesus knows that he's coming. And so Jesus uses this example of a king. And he says, if a king had a kingdom, who would pay the taxes in his kingdom? Would the king pay his taxes? Would the king's sons pay his taxes? And, and Simon Peter's like, well, no. So Jesus is like, yeah, so we don't have to pay them either. I'm the king. You guys are my sons, my, my disciples. We don't have to pay the temple tax. That's, that's, we don't have to. We're exempt from it because kings are exempt from paying the temple tax. Does that make sense? He was not only the king, he was the high priest. Priests are exempt from paying the temple taxes as well because they were, uh, they, it was their inheritance. Yeah, some, some would argue, and I pay tithe, but some people would even argue that pastors uh, don't have to pay tithe. I don't believe that we're Levites, but some people take it to that. But I think that everybody should pay tithe. Um, and so Jesus uh, goes and he says, well, I don't have to pay tithe, but I am the high priest. As the high, I mean, it says in Hebrews, right? He's the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the priest of Israel even before the law came. Jesus is the high priest. He doesn't have to pay taxes. He receives, he receives the tithe. He doesn't pay the tithe, so he doesn't have to give of, his, give of himself. But he says to Peter in this insta, instance, we are free. 
We are free. And he, and he says, go and give it for me and for you. And, and what, what Jesus is doing in this instance is he's, he's differentiating himself from the commoners. And he's saying, you know what? I am king of kings and I have lord of lords. I am Messiah. I am the high priest in the order of kills day. I'm not bound to pay these paltry taxes that you guys want me to pay. I receive these things. I don't give these things. Why would I have to pay them? And so what he does is, is he says to Peter, so as not to offend so it's not to offend. Now, we've talked about this word offend before, uh, scandalizo in the Greek. It's, it's not an idea of like, oh, he didn't invite me to the party. I'm offended. Like, it's not that kind of offense. It's an offense of leading somebody into sin. And so Jesus, knowing full well that everybody else around him needs to pay the tax, they need to stay in a right relationship with God. Jesus has not yet paid the penalty for their sins. And so these people actually have to pay for their atonement. They actually have to pay for all this stuff to happen. And so he's like, you know what? Because we don't want to lead anybody else into sin because they don't understand what is going on with me and with you. I'm the priest. I'm the father. I'm the son. I'm the, I'm the, uh, righteous, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the righteous way that people are going to be in relationship with me. That hasn't all happened yet. So let's just pay the temple tax so that everybody else around us doesn't lose their mind. Does that make sense? These other people that don't know Jesus yet are strangers and sons. Why do you, what do you think? Simon Peter, from whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers? So he's still receiving the temple tax. And, and make no mistake, friend, Jesus is not minimizing the temple tax. He's actually showing value in the temple tax. He's saying that this is something good for people to do to support the ministry of the household of God. So it doesn't matter, Peter. We're going to pay this tax. We're just going to pay it miraculously. Yeah. And use my money. <laughs> Jesus had money, make no mistake. Judas was the money keeper. Judas had a bag. They had money to do ministry all the time. But Jesus says, we're not going to use that money. We're going to do something miraculous because I want people to learn something from this story. And so we're just going to trust that God is going to bring money through the fish's mouth so that we can pay this temple tax. Now, there's, a, there's a few themes I want to pull out of this uh, sermon, and, and some of this is going to feel really good to you as you're receiving it. Um, I know it. Um, amen? How come you guys didn't say amen when I said that? It's like you guys aren't excited to read the, ingra- ready to receive the engrafted word. First, first thing I want to say this morning is this, is that giving because you want to, not because you have to, is powerful. That's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was giving not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Jesus was giving not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Now, I'm I'm making a point here this morning, talking about the temple tax and talking about what we do here. God has always asked his people to give of their money for his earthly purposes. He's always done it. And, 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 and I want you to pay attention. Earlier on when Dan said what we say every single week about giving, don't give if you're not saved, don't give if you're a first-time visitor, don't give if you have a good heart, don't give if you have a problem with somebody. I believe all of that, 100%. God does not need you to, to give money so that he can accomplish his work on this earth. But nonetheless, God does use some people that are willing to give their money to him to accomplish his will on this earth. Many people have gotten saved in a local church. Many people got saved at summer camps and through television ministry and radio ministry, through Bibles being published, all that stuff. And that stuff costs money. And it just happens. Most of us were saved through some sort of thing that somebody invested some sort of money to lead us to Christ. That's just the truth. God could have used any other means, but that was the main, the main means in which he accomplishes stuff on this side of heaven. Now, in the New Testament church, we do not require a tax to worship God. We don't require it. That's not something that we do. Uh, people attend this church for years and never give a dime. There's people that do it all the time. They love to partake, but they don't love to give. They're, they're spiritual fornicators. They like the benefits of the body with no commitment. Want all the benefits without having to invest anything in it, right? I'm just preaching the truth. Now I'll say this, they might make it to heaven without giving a dime. They might. Why are you guys so quiet? 
Now, I'll say this, man. Now, I will definitively say this. You can make it to heaven with never giving a penny to Jesus. Yeah. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Now, the theology of Matt Crichunas, though, is this. So you can take it or leave it. <laughs> I'm telling you straight up. On, this isn't Bible. This is my opinion. So if I'm ever giving you my opinion, you can just be like, I ain't listening to that. This is my opinion. If you're saved, and I'm not talking, no, don't, we're not going to split nails on, you know, if you're falling out of an airplane, you never had a chance to give, right? You're like, I love you, Jesus. Like, you make heaven, right? But, 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 so, but somebody that like knows the truth and reads their Bible and says that they're saved and say they love Jesus. And so you lived a whole entire Christian existence and you never gave a buck? You never, like, supported a missionary? You, you, you never paid for a Bible for somebody? You never gave money to a church? You never donated it? Like, never? Like, God set you free. Law of sin, like, your life free, and he changed you and redeemed you. You had a new mind and a new spirit. Your life was changed and everything was awesome. But nothing? Like, I would just kind of be like... Okay. That's me. You guys can take it however you want, but that's me. That, that's, that would be what my thought would be. Because me, I'm convinced that God wants me to give 10%. That's what I'm convinced. I believe he wants me to give above and beyond that. I, 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 Crystal and I, we give 10%. We always have for the last 24 years of our marriage. And we give an extra 2.5% to missions. We give an extra 2.5% to offering. People say, oh, you're boasting. No, nah, I'm not boasting. I'm just telling you how I live my life. Yeah. Is it boasting to say I took my wife out to dinner? No, I took care of my bride. Oh. Right? Amen. My baby wants it. She gets it. Even if you went to go eat at Nordstrom's to have lunch, and as you were walking out, she tried on a pair of shoes yesterday. And I said, honey, those shoes are cute. I said, how are you going to pay for those shoes? And she goes, I have my own money. But it is Mother's Day tomorrow. I said, you know what, baby? You get those shoes. You're worth it. She's worth it. Here's what's true. The standard of the New Testament is always higher than the Old Testament. Because yes. God says in the New Testament, if you don't want to give, you don't have to. Because right. your giving is not what puts you in a right relationship with God yes. at all. It's your relationship with my son that puts you in a right relationship with me. Not, money is not the, the connection point to be in righteousness. Now, in the Old Testament, the connection point for righteousness is you had to go buy an animal and sacrifice it, and then you would bring it to God and sacrifice it. Your sins are forgiven. Yeah. Now, many of you, if I said you could write a check to atone for your sins and then go out there and live however you want and come back every week to just write a check, we'd be beating them off of the stick. People would like, throw it down and run out and live like the devil. That's what people would do because they could pay atonement for their sin. That's easy. It's easy to pay money for your sins. Standard of the New Testament is higher. The standard of the New Testament is you better have your heart right. You better have your mind right. You better be living a righteous life. You better be believing in Jesus. So when you stack rank money and your heart right, man, getting your heart right is a lot harder than just writing a check. Standard of the New Testament is always higher than the standard of the Old Testament. Exodus 30, 15, the rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. We never find that language in the New Testament. New Testament says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's why we say what we say every single week, because we, we want to be excited about it. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I got to do this. I'm like, you want this? What more? God, take it all. What do you want? Yeah, Have it all. Because the standard of the New Testament is higher than the standard of the Old Testament. 
The standard of the Old Testament is 10%. The standard of the New Testament is all. Got to give it all. That's why we say every week, don't give. It's not the beginning of your relationship with Jesus. It's not where it starts. It starts with Jesus. Amen. But I believe that once you're saved, you're, you're just going to want to give. You just are. Like, what one of us is a, a, on a human relationship doesn't enjoy somebody buying us a meal? Because it makes us feel loved. It makes us feel appreciated. It makes us feel valued. That They would sacrifice to give us something or buy us something. That's how human relationships work. If you love someone, you usually do that too. Like, oh, I just want to give you this. Why? Because I love you. I just want to be with you, man. Like, I, I want to buy you this. I want to take you out. I want to take care of you. Why? Because I love you. The New Testament is a higher standard than the Old Testament. Good. Old Testament, don't kill. New Testament, don't hate. Yeah. It's easy to not kill somebody. It's hard to not hate. Yeah. Old Testament, no adultery. New Testament, no lust. Yeah. It's a higher standard. Yeah. Old Testament, all you have to do is sacrifice livestock. New Testament, you have to sacrifice your own body. The standard of the New Testament is always higher than the standard of the Old Testament. And don't come at me with this tithe is for the Old Testament. Tithing predates the law. Gave to Melchizedek long before the law came. Don't come, and say, I don't believe it. All right, well then just be reading the New Testament. Don't claim no Psalms. Wipe off that Jeremiah 29 11 tattoo off your arm. <laughs> Jesus, in this scripture, is saying to Peter, we are not required, not for the temple tax because I am the temple, not for the money because I am the priest in the order of Melchizedek. I'm not required to pay. But because we don't want to lead other people into sin who need to pay to make atonement, it's not a requirement because I don't have to atone for my sins because I'm sinless. But people giving money to the temple of God for a good thing, we're going to give money to the temple of God. What's wrong with that? What's wrong, what's wrong with taking care of the house of God? We're going to do it. Because yeah. God loves a heart that gives uh, willfully and not out of obligation. So Jesus gives and he, he shows that to us. I'm not required to do that. I just love to give, man. Just going to do it. Exodus 35, 2, speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. That's what it said in Exodus. God still appreciates willful offerings all the way back in Exodus. He knows the heart condition that does that. Isn't this the same that we do with our human relationships? Don't we value willing generosity more than coerced demands yes. based on what we think the other person should do for us? Yeah. Try this in your marriage. You're my husband. You have to do this. You're my wife. You must do this. <laughs> that will not work, bro. <laughs> it ain't going to work at all. When, when, when your spouse or your friend does something they don't have to, it means so much more when they do it because they have to. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Of course. Of course. None of your relationships are coerced. You always give willingly. And so we should give to God willingly and abundantly. And 10%, I say, is a really good start. But the New Testament is to give all. And, and like I said, we don't stop at 10. Why? Not because I'm trying to boast. We just love to give, man. Yeah. And, and so the, the challenge of this part of the sermon is to ask yourself of where you're at in your giving. Does it feel obligatory or does it feel like you're giving uh, out of freedom? That you're, that you're just, because you love God. Do you just give freely to the God that rescued you in adoration of what he's done? Do you give to God and say, Lord, I know that you can do more with this and more people can come to know you. And I, I, I just, I just, I don't, you know, it's funny about the tithe. And you get a pastor talking about tithing, he can go off the rails. <laughs> I, this isn't in my notes. I'll just say it. I really think that even if we see the tithe do great things, but I would say, even if God had written the Bible and he didn't, for you to take 10% of your earnings every, every month and go outside and burn it to the ground and watch it burn, it would still have the same effect on your heart to learn to not love your money. Yeah. 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 You just watch it burn. Yeah. God says, hey, it's a aroma to my nose. He could have done it that way. But, but luckily, I mean, he's a, bless God, he lets us see it do great things. But the point is for you to not love your money, for you to understand that it doesn't belong to you, to understand that it's unto God. That's a whole other sermon. 
First Chronicles 29, 17, I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy, I've seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. A generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. Be generous, not because you're required to, but because you want to, man. It's powerful. Because here's the other part of it. I want you to understand what's going on in this story. Jesus does not have to give, and so he gives. He has freedom. Does that make sense? He has freedom. He has agency. He's able to make his own decisions because of who he is. And in his agency, and in his, he decides what he is going to do with that freedom. The application for us is whether it's freedom in giving or anything else, how we live in our freedom to Christ matters. There, there is much that we are allowed to do that isn't unbiblical, it just may not be right. Yeah. Jesus Christ, through his atonement and our faith, has put us in a right relationship with God. We are in a right relationship with God because of who he is and what he's done. And there's no righteousness that is of ourselves. It is only a righteousness that comes from God and him alone. And we're no longer bound by many Old Testament practices, including the temple tax. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. But, but here's how people will use their freedom in Christ. Their liberty in Christ. They will use it to sin. That's what they'll do, man. They'll, they'll take the grace of God for a spin and use the excuse of liberty and grace as a reason why they're free to sin. Because people say, well, this, this is, I mean, it's not unbiblical. Or even if it is, pff, I'm covered by the blood. I'm going to be taken care of. I can do whatever I want. I can treat people how I want. I can live how I want because I know that I can be forgiven later on. The Bible addresses this in Romans 6. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Jude 4 says, these people turn the grace of God into lewdness. Here's my point. We cannot hide behind forgiveness as a reason to live how we want to live. We can't. The freedom that we have in Christ has a responsibility to us, whether or not it makes us lose our salvation or not. And what happens, here's the worst part of it, is that people craft these narratives in their heads when they get taught things like once saved, always saved. We knew this gal that believed the once saved, always saved, and, and she was sleeping uh, with a married man. She was single. And we confronted her and, and we said, you're sleeping with a married man. And she said, and I quote, I'm saved by my faith. Oh. And she said, and I quote, I'm not in sin. He is. He's the one that's married. I, I'm confused. Liberty, liberty. I can live however I want. Our, our freedom in Christ should call us to a deeper commitment and a deeper holiness for him, not taking advantage of his grace. Jesus had freedom not to give. He still gave. He used his freedom for good. He didn't use his freedom as a reason to say, well, I don't have to and I'm not going to. And I don't care. I don't care how what I do affects anybody else. No, he said so as not to offend so as not to lead somebody else into sin. I am going to do what is right, even though I'm not required to do so. I'm going to do the right thing for the benefit of other people that are watching to ensure that they don't end up in sin with their lives. 1 Peter 2.16 as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Now, a slave is somebody that has to do what their master says. They're owned by their master. A bond servant is somebody who's free and willfully submits to a master and says, I'm free, but I'm still going to submit to you as my owner, and you can do with me whatever you see fit. <laughs> Excuse me. 
So for us as Christians, we are, we are slaves to righteousness, not by Jesus controlling us, but by us willfully submitting to him and saying, Lord, we will give our lives to you. We are your servants. We're choosing indentured servitude. We're choosing to be controlled by you. We are bond servants and we will do what we're told to do because you own us. And so our liberty is very, very important to watch, to pay attention to how we use this. 1 Corinthians 8, 9, but beware lest somehow this liberty, this freedom of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. That means for, for us as Christians, what we are able to do and what we can take part in, it should not become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Amen? Because here's what happens when you don't take care of your grace. Did you hear that? Yep. When you don't take care of your grace, you can lead other people into sin. Yeah. And, and I always like to use this as an example. I use the example of alcohol, right? And, I, and let me make this abundantly clear. Drunkards will go to hell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bible's clear about that. Yes. Drunkenness will keep you out of heaven. Yes. Now, one drink will not keep you from heaven. Yeah. Nobody said amen. Amen. If you're like, don't say amen, he'll know. (laughs) He'll know we're sipping saints. (laughs) Listen, all I preach is truth, man. I'm not going to twist the scriptures to say, I mean, the the Bible says that consuming alcohol makes a merry heart glad. That's what it says. The point is, where does making a merry heart glad pass over into drunkenness? Right? Right? Bible says, have a little bit for your stomach. I mean, Jesus turned water into wine. I'm not going to, I'm not a prohibitionist in that. I'm not a teetotaler, right? Here's my rule. If you can't have one, you get none. And when I say one, it's like a 12 ounce or it's not a 40 ounce of old English. Okay. A 40 ounce of malt liquor. Talking about, I only had one pastor. It's a two liter. Only one. I've never been a drunkard. I've never been a partier, right? But there's people that I know in this church that say things to me like, I'm not going to drink one because I don't know how to do that. I only know how to pass out and black out, right? And so they don't drink. They don't take part in it at all because they know their propensity for it. And here's where the liberty becomes a problem is that some people will say, I'm free to have a a, a glass of wine or to consume a, a, a beer, whatever. And the truth is, you are, you are. But if you put that on social media and someone's struggling with it, you can lead them into sin. If you choose to go out and, and, and offer alcohol at your house and your freedom to somebody that's on the precipice of alcoholism, you can destroy their family. If you walk around and tell people like, it's fine, pastor said, have one, let's go have five and ask for forgiveness. You can lead somebody into sin. How you use your liberty matters. Have I made it clear? Do you understand? Men and women exposing their bodies. Your exposing of your body is not a sin in and of itself. It's not. And and, and this isn't just a, a word for women. Because women, you know, women have bodies, but so do men. Yeah. Women are just as nasty as men. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, did you see him? So how you present yourself matters. It does. So I'm free to wear whatever I want. If I'm showing whatever, it's their fault. And you're right. You're right. That person should have their mind right. They, they, they should, you know, not be lusting. They should not be thinking horrible things. But it, but it begs the question, in your liberty, why, why would you entice the opposite sex in such a way that you could lead them into lust and lead them into adultery? You lead them into sexual immorality. That you could, you know, content, that you could tempt them with what you have. Liberty as a cloak for sin. And these are, these are those things that you, you have to really ingest and say, man, what am I using my, my, my freedom for? Are you going to defend your freedom at the expense of somebody falling into sexual immorality? Your freedom for somebody to fall into drunkenness? Your cussing? Man, because here's the thing. You can say a cuss word and still make heaven. 
At least I hope so, based on what I say sometimes. <laughs> Some of y'all, I cannot believe that pastor. <laughs> Listen, I told y'all, man, I grew up on the mean streets of Ballard. You know what I'm saying? I was in the U.S. Army. We had a three-word vocabulary. <laughs> it's the way that it is, man. And there's been times when I'm alone in my garage trying to make something work, and I am not speaking in tongues. <laughs> And if that's too much for you to handle, I apologize, man. I apologize. I really do. I am human, right? But it'd be a whole lot different. I'm like, open up the effing Bible today. Y'all would be, y'all couldn't even have, I just said F. I meant forgiveness. Open up your forgiving Bible today. Because words matter, right? You got to be careful how you use your liberty. Yes. You got to be careful how you use your freedom. Yes. You brethren have been called to liberty, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Because that's the issue right here. Do we see our freedom as a means to satisfy our flesh, or we see it as a means to serve one another in love? Because if we're serving someone else, we care less about us. It, it's like Facebook. You, you don't have to rub it in everybody's face that you got a new thing, or you went somewhere, or whatever. I'm not against that. You bought it, you earned it, you went there, you had fun, like, 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 like. But there's a point at where you've got to realize, like, what am I trying to convey to other people and how am I trying to make other people feel based on my social media? Yeah, that's good. It's just part of how this world works. And again, there's no sin in that. If you bought it and you own it, you do it all day. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You just have to think about what you're doing is affecting other people. And you are in your social media. You always think about, you already are selective in what you share. I ain't seen one person share on social media. Just got done with quiet time with my spouse and whoo buddy. (laughs) It's true. But it's true because you show restraint. You know that how what you post would affect somebody else's life. You actually keep some things private that you, honestly, as married people, you don't have to keep that private. How was your morning? Well, you know, it's funny you should bring that up. (laughs) There's no sin in that. There's no sin that married people should be saying amen. Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. It's what married folk do. But you have to show restraint. Don't use your liberty as a cloak for vice to become a stumbling block to somebody else. It's nobody's business what you're doing, what you, pro- what you post. But what you approve of can lead someone else into sin. And it's real, man. And some of you say, well, pastor, I'm American. I can do what I want. I have to listen to you or nobody else. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. Submitting to one another in the fear of God, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so this was the issue that Jesus was making with this temple tax. So it's not to offend, so it's not to lead people to sin. Let's do the right thing publicly so that those that are bound will do so privately. And I, and I would ask you, I would say, if Jesus can humble himself and do something for the benefit of others, can you find it in your heart to do it for the benefit of others? Even though you're free to do whatever you want, you can still say, you know what, man, I'm not going to use it. Don't let my freedom be a stumbling block to somebody else. The Bible says in Romans 14, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. In what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he who does not eat from faith for whatever is not of faith is sin. And I'll drive this point home and then we'll move on to the last point. This idea of our freedom, of what we have, encapsulates what we wear, what we do, how we live, what we watch, how we spend our time and our money. It's our speech. It's an idea of how I live affects other people. And, and, and I'll say the last thing about this point before I get to my final point. It's what, and this is a real like 
annoyance unbiblical to me about Facebook. Would you please quit liking the new relationship of somebody without understanding what happened to the last relationship? Would you just stop that? Because what happens is, is these fornicating adulterers craft a public image and then start a new relationship. Oh, congrats. So excited for you. Are you? Because you don't know how that last relationship ended. You don't know if it was biblical. You're out here encouraging them in their sin because they're begging for likes, hoping that you'll like their new relationship after they had an adulterous affair with their spouse and they moved on. But you have now condemned yourself by what you approve. Show restraint. Don't approve unless you know. Pastor Crystals has a new pair of shoes. I don't know how she got those. I don't know how she got those shoes. I'm not going to click like unless I call her up and say, did you steal those shoes, Pastor Crystal? <laughs> Here's the last point. <clears throat> we serve a God of the miraculous, amen? Yes. There's a sermon at the end of this interaction, which I think is really great. Now, I wanted to just do the miraculous coin in the fish's mouth sermon and the Lord did not free me for that this week. There was all this other stuff that I felt like he wanted us to cover this week. But the end of it is good. We do serve a God of the miraculous. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, let's pay the tax, but the means by which we're going to pay the tax is going to be miraculous. And you have to think about this. The fish that he went for had the right denomination of coin to pay for two guys, right? It wasn't, the, it wasn't a coin to pay for one. He said, go down and get this fish, and this fish is going to pay for both of this. This is miraculous. Peter was a fisherman. He could have gone down, and, and he could have said, go down and catch a bunch of fish, chop up a hundred of them, and you should be able to find a coin in one of those hundred fishes. But he didn't say that. He said, the fisherman that usually uses the nets, go down and use a hook to catch one fish. And that first fish that you bring out is going to have a coin in his mouth, and it's going to be enough to pay for you and I, the guys that have freedom that didn't even have to pay this, because we serve a God of the miraculous that can provide, that can take care of us. If we will honor God, God and we will do things for God. He will take care of us. We just have to do what he asks us to do. It's miraculous. Honestly, I think it's one of the miracles that, that really get underplayed. It, it, it's unbelievable what God can do with somebody that, that is able to uh, be obedient to what God is asking him to do. Amen. You guys have your issues. I have mine. There's a few nuggets in here that are vastly underrated. One of the few nuggets that is in this story is that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Only God can make a miracle like this happen. Who else could do it? It's not a parlor trick. It's not a magician's trick. It's, it's, it's a miracle by the living God. And so Jesus does this miracle to be able to show to people, because again, he, th- this audience needs to know that he is God in the flesh. Amen? John 10, 30, I and my father are one. John 8, 58, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Psalm 77, 14, you are the God who does wonders. And so for this story to the people that were there and to us hearing it today and to the Jewish readers, we can know that Jesus is God in the flesh. Secondly, God does not work in generalities. He works in specifics. You think that you are just an individual in a sea of 8 billion people? No. God knows you individually. He knows you specifically. The Bible says that the very hairs on your head are numbered. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb. <coughs> Psalm 139, your eyes saw my unformed substance. Isaiah 49, the Lord, the Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. Galatians 1. 15, he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me. Romans 8, 29, predestined and foreknew. This is not a God that operates in generalities. This is a God that works in specifics, that knows you. And so as you're walking through this life and you say, man, does, does God even know me? Yes. Does he know what's going on in my life? Yes. He specifically knows the details about your life. And if you are not walking with an awareness of God's specific knowledge of you, you, your situation, and your sins, you are not walking with the full awareness of your relationship with God. 
Because God does know you specifically. He knows everything about you. And if he can have Peter go find one fish, he can surely find you in a sea of people. I guarantee it that he can find you in a sea of people. Thirdly, when you walk in obedience to God because of his grace, he always provides. When you walk in obedience to God because of his grace, he will always provide for you. I think it's so beautiful that in this story, Peter could have gone and bought, he could have gone and gathered a bunch of fish, sold the fish to pay the temple tax. That was been a, God, Jesus could have said that, go, you're a fisherman, go get some of your fish, sell them, we'll go pay this tax. Nope. He didn't want to do it that way. I want, I want to show you, Peter, if you will be obedient to me. I will do miraculous things inside of your life. I will provide for you. Philippians 4, my God shall supply all your needs. 2 Corinthians 9, may have an abundance for every good work. Matthew 6, your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Psalm 34, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Who are you trusting for your provision? What miracle are you waiting for? Because I believe the God of this universe will show up and do a miracle through your obedience. Amen. Amen. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know that he will. Amen. Amen. Learn about the temple tax. Learn about what this interaction means. Give because you want to, not because you have to. Use your freedom in a good way. And serve the God of the miraculous. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I'd like to invite you to become one. It's really quite easy. Either you're a Christian or you're not. Either you've given your life to Jesus or you haven't. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to give my life to him. Never made that decision before. And you say, Pastor, today I want to make that decision. I want to pray with you. Just raise your hand right now and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Is there anybody that needs to do that for the first time? Maybe you made that decision before. It's been a long time. Remind yourself in church today and say, Pastor, I just want to come back to Jesus. I've been gone for a long time. I don't want to rededicate my life to Jesus. If you need to make that decision, you raise your hand as well. And for the rest of us, man, I know. That God touched one person. Some of this was for you. I don't know what part. Maybe it's about your money or your heart, liberty, not believing in miracles. Father, we just submit your word today, God. We pray that it would do its work. Don't let it go down into the deep soil of our hearts. Let it make it past the parking lot, God. Let it just grow and be fruitful so that we can live a life that's worth it. like to thank you so much for joining us today online. We want to encourage you to like our Facebook page, follow us on social media. If you're a regular watcher of Faith and Victory Online, would you please send us a message because we want to get to know you. We want to be connected with you. Make sure you like and share this video and we'll see you next week at Faith and Victory Church. We love you. Have a great day.